Before I talk to you about the book that I wrote called A Provocative Mothers and Their Precocious Daughters, I think I'll tell you why I wrote the book. For years, I was a women's history teacher who was somewhat dissatisfied with the material I had in front of me to share with my students. And they were somewhat dissatisfied with it as well. So I decided to delve into the private lives of the women that were our leaders, the women who were our pioneers. And delving into those private lives, I became fascinated with the daughters that many of them have and the relationships that the mothers and daughters shared that affected the women's roles as leaders and that affected their daughters as well. So the name of the book is, and here's the book, title, the book cover right behind me. The name of the book is Provocative Mothers and Their Precocious Daughters. First off, let me make it clear that these provocative women were not provocative in the sense that many of us think would be um, alluring or sexy or um, trying to attract men, for example, but they were provocative in the fact that they provoked us. They um, annoyed us because they spoke out for their rights and they made sure that they were heard. Now their daughters were all precocious in different ways, but most of them were well-educated and they went ahead and followed in their mother's footsteps, but not in the same way altogether. So the first women, um, I'm going to talk about two women from Massachusetts and two women from New York State. Right here is Abby Kelly Foster and her daughter, Ola Foster. Abby Kelly Foster was from Worcester, Massachusetts. Abby was born in 1811 and she died in 1887. Abby was probably the most um, attractive as well as the most provocative of all of the women that I'm going to be talking with you about. Her daughter, Alla, was the least provocative of all the daughters and probably was the least apt to follow in her mother's footsteps traditionally in terms of being a well-known woman's rights leaders. She never married, she never had children, and she pretty much stayed as a single school teacher in the um, area of Worcester, Massachusetts for her whole life. The next set of daughters that you can see here chronologically would be Martha Wright and her daughter, Ellen Wright Garrison. Ellen Wright Garrison married William Lloyd Garrison's son, William Jr which sort of gave her an edge up in the um, civil rights or the revolutionary um, aspect of being an abolitionist because her mother was quite pleased that she went on to marry the son of one of her dear friends, William Lloyd Garrison. Martha Wright, we best know for um, her role in the Women's Rights Convention in um, 1848 and also her role as a sister of Lucretia Mott, the famous Quaker leader. Ellen and Martha, were um, in a way the most traditional of the women here. They had, um, Ellen had married and had children. Martha was a grandmother and loved that role, but they started out more as um, a conflicting mother-daughter uh, team as I'll talk with you in, a moment, in just a moment. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the most famous and we are actually in Seneca Falls this month celebrating her home, celebrating her heritage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the mother to Harriet Stanton Blatch, who married um, Harry Blatch and they lived in England for most of her adult life. Harriet um, would become a very well-known leader in the women's rights movement, especially in New York state. And the fourth of our team is or of our group is Lucy Stone and Alice Stone Blackwell. Here's Lucy and here's Alice. They are from Massachusetts, from Worcester, close to the Kellys, the Abby Kelly Foster family. And Lucy Stone, you will remember well as one of the only women of our group here who went to college. Then her daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, went on to be a leader, but in a slightly different way. So now I will move into a screen sharing so I can give you a few more photos and a few more details about each of the women that we're um, emphasizing today. today. I often talk about my eight women to groups that are not quite as familiar to women's historians as many of us. 
So in order to make my eight women more recognizable and memorable to my audiences, I give them titles. So here we have Martha Coffin Wright, 1886 to 75, and her daughter, Ellen Wright Garrison, who was born in 1840, the first of the daughters who were born and died in 1931. You can see that she lived quite a long life. So the relationship and with Martha and Ellen was really riven with conflict. Another theme I like to stress with my audiences and my readers is the universality of mother and daughterhood. The universality would include conflict because as those of us who are either mothers or grandmothers or who act as mothers or mentors to women or boys, we, um, we recognize the fact that this is sometimes a conflicting relationship. And for Martha and Ellen, they were the most at odds with each other of all of my teams. I also love to label my leading ladies, my women's rights leaders. And I call Martha managing or micromanager Martha. You'll see as we go into a little bit more about their lives, what I mean by micromanaging Martha. Here's Martha Coffin Wright. Many of you have seen this picture because it's um, at Seneca Falls. It's in the Women's Rights um, Hall of Fame, as many of my women are in the Women's Rights Hall of Fame. Here's Martha, probably at the age of about 45 or 50. Uh, many of our women were never photographed, and when they were, they just sat stiffly, and they don't necessarily look like themselves. But this is a great depiction of Martha, I think. And um, she was um, a a woman who followed Quaker ways, but as you can see here with some bows in her, on her shirt and ribbon in her hair, she's not exactly the stern Quaker look as many of us have seen. One of the things I'd like to point out about Martha is that although we know her from the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, Martha and many other women like her were involved in the anti-slavery movement long before the Women's Rights Convention. So the Women's Rights Convention, we're lately pointing out, was not the absolute first time that many of these women walked down to the stage of women's rights. Martha joined William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833, a full 15 years before she showed up at Seneca Falls. When Martha showed up at Seneca Falls, it was 1848 and she happened to be six months pregnant. So in the statues that many of us see and some of you are visiting Seneca Falls this month, you will see Martha as the tallest bronze woman standing six months pregnant, which the um, artist did on purpose. She could have showed her in any other way, but that was Martha at the convention. Here's Martha and Ellen. Ellen in this picture could be 10, 11, 12, perhaps. Um, Ellen looks just like a pleasant little girl. Martha perhaps looks a little bit sterner, but Ellen and Martha gave us a great gift. And their great gift is the letters that they wrote to each other throughout their lives. These letters begin when Ellen was at boarding school. And I really could not um, do justice to both of them without telling you a few stories about Ellen and Martha while they were apart and um, the advice that micromanaging Martha sent to her daughter. So let me quote a few from, uh, from a few of the letters. Handwriting was a big deal for Martha and she wanted to be sure that Ellen's handwriting was perfect. She did not want her to have any flourishes. She did not want her to have anything spelled wrong. And she often listed the exact examples of the words that poor Ellen spelled wrong in her letters. Now, Ellen went off to boarding school, not alone, but with a younger brother. So she also was in charge of him and she was in charge of her own clothes, which is not terribly unusual, but many of the clothes she took to boarding school were um, a bit small. She was growing out of them. So one of the pranks that she kind of played on her mother was purposely jumping out of, um, not trees, sometimes trees, or jumping off of, um, steps or um, high places where she could get her clothing ripped or dirty so she wouldn't have to wear it anymore. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Ellen is that she writes to her mother, you are so 
lecturing always, which meant that every single letter was filled with lectures from her mother of what she should be doing. Her mother responds, so you think I'm luxury? Well, I won't be luxury anymore, but then she proceeded to continue to be quite luxury throughout the three years that Ellen was away at boarding school. One of the myths that um, I took into the research with me was that Martha and all the other mothers would encourage their daughters to attend women's rights conventions because that after all was what they were doing. And this is what they would have used to inspire their daughters to do the same kind of work they did. Martha and Ellen give us a great ex um, example of how this did not happen. Martha was far more concerned with Ellen's discreet behavior, especially with the opposite sex, than she was with Ellen appearing at conventions and meeting Martha's friends. Now, granted, she definitely was interested in Ellen meeting Lucy Stone, um, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, and of course, a, a Susan B. Anthony. And Susan B. Anthony and Ellen Wright developed a, a nice relationship between an older woman and a younger girl. And they wrote letters, which are also very telling to us. But Martha was very worried about why Ellen was coming to a convention. And she was really exactly um, correct when she realized that Ellen wanted to come to her first, first convention in 1855, when she was only 15, because she had um, become interested in a minister and had been writing his letters and his sermons and decided that she would like to meet him. So the real reason she went to her first convention was to meet this minister. She had um, a crush on him and inappropriately, he took her, um, took her attention um, to heart and would go walking with her and spending more time with her than um, a married man probably late in his 30s should have done. From then on then, Martha said, Ellen, why don't we wait a few years before you return to conventions? Ellen um, took her mother's advice and she was a good sport about it, but Ellen was quite a flirt with many boys. And Ellen gives us another very interesting insight into her relationship with an African-American man. And um, we see her not quite dating, but somewhat interested in him. But the letters that she writes exposing her real feelings about what it would have been like or the impossibility of marrying someone of an African-American race were um, showed us how the abolitionists, although they were anti-slavery, were still somewhat wary of their daughters marrying men who were um, African-American. And we have good letters between Martha and Ellen about that subject as well. So here's Ellen when she's perhaps 25. Um, she's a very attractive young woman. She has a lot of friends. Ellen is the only woman of the four daughters who did not go to college. And this really wasn't because only because she was a daughter, because her father did not think any of the children, they had seven children, he didn't think it was appropriate for any of them to go to college. In the end, two of the boys would go to college, but Ellen did not. But Ellen found education in many other ways. She was um, very interested in French and in German. She was a very good pianist. Actually, she and Martha had this in, com um, in common. They both were very good pianists. They bought a piano for Ellen when she was a little girl because they recognized her skill. Of course, Martha used this in, as an excuse to also hassle Ellen about not practicing enough or not reading or playing the right kind of music, but this did give them a nice bond. So I talked about micromanaging Martha. As Ellen got older, Martha continued to micromanage her, but in a, in a less, um, scolding way. Ellen, when she was in her early 20s, met the son of William Lloyd Garrison. I said earlier that she marries William Lloyd Garrison Jr. Ellen went into her relationship with William, with Will, with a great physical disadvantage, which is another telling aspect of this mother-daughter relationship. Ellen was plagued with very serious headaches her whole life. So as she developed a romance with Will, 
she realized that she should try to make one last effort to go to um, a sanitarium to get some help with her headaches. Now, at this trip to her at the sanitarium, we are also given the great opportunity of seeing Ellen's relationship with a young woman her age. Many of us realize that women had what would look like romances with other women during the 19th century. Ellen Wright had what we would call a romance. She loved her friend, Lucy McKim, who coincidentally ends up marrying Will's older brother. So the women become sisters-in-law, but she speaks of, I can't wait to sleep with you again. I can't wait to hold you in my arms. And we've learned so much about the 19th century women and how they their emotions were physical and it was very appropriate. But while Ellen was trying to deal with her headaches, she turned to Lucy McKim. And she actually turned finally to some doctors who eventually helped her out. And Will, her, her who would become her new husband, was very helpful here. Martha was helpful in an odd way. She was helpful in a stern way. She was impatient with Ellen, but then she sent her also, also off to um, Clifton Springs to a hospital or a, like a sanitarium to help with her headaches. So Ellen went on to have this wonderful marriage and she takes her interest in not only German and French, but anti-slavery. Ellen was exposed to many, many new ideas through her mother and her father because they were both active in the um, um, anti-slavery movement. They welcomed fugitive slaves into their home. Ellen experienced this when she was a little girl. And they introduced her to um, many, many speakers, including Frederick Douglass, who stayed in their home. So Ellen had a broad, broad exposure to lots of ideas. So when Ellen was married, she and Will continued this interest. They went to anti-slavery meetings, they went to the opera, they went to lectures, and they had many um, courses that they even took from home. So Ellen eventually became what prematurely might be called a new woman because she joined clubs, she went to meetings, and she went on to have five children. Three of these children were young women. Uh, two of them never married. One of them, Agnes Wright, became very active in the women's rights movement and then in the suffrage movement in New York State. Now, our second team of women is Abby Kelly Foster and Alla Foster. They are very different than Martha and Ellen because Abby Kelly Foster was not as bossy to Alla, but she wasn't very home very much. Uh, she wasn't home very much. So I called their relationship a long distance bond. For her first 12 years, Abby was rarely at home with her daughter. And it wasn't until Abby was afflicted with scoliosis that, excuse me, when Alla was afflicted with scoliosis that Abby came home to stay with her full time. So I call Abby absent Abby. Again, when I'm talking about eight women, four pairs of mothers and daughters, I use these little clues to remind us that managing Martha was a little bit different than absent Abby. So Abby Kelly Foster, again, photographs in the 19th century are bleak and the women don't look quite as lovely as they were. Abby Kelly Foster was one of the women that was one of the most attractive anti-slavery leaders in the 19th century. It was actually kind of a disadvantage to her because she was so lovely that she could not act at all flirtatious when she was giving her speeches. One of the renowned aspects about Abby is that early on, long before the Seneca Falls Convention in the 18, late 1830s, early 1840s, Abby Kelly Foster kind of picked up the um, leadership from the Gremke sisters, Agnes and Sarah, and began teaching and speaking publicly to what we call promiscuous audiences. Now, a promiscuous audience is an audience that is composed of both men and women in the room. So in those days, in the 1830s and early 40s, it was considered 
outlandish if you as a woman walked into a room and spoke to both men and women. So not only was Abby speaking to men and women, what she was speaking about, even in New England, was anti-slavery. Most people did not approve of these talks because most people supported slavery. In the North, we may not have been owning many slaves by the 1840s and 50s. Well, we were definitely made a lot of money from the slave trade and from the cotton and the sugar that they were manufacturing in the South. So America at that point was still considered a pro-slavery country. Abby getting up to tell everyone they should be against slavery was um, not very popular. So people threw rotten fruit at her, they threw, threw rotten eggs at her, they threw little pieces of bricks at her. Sometimes they would turn out the lights in the middle of her talks. They would put pepper on top of the heater so it would start smoking and uh, making a bad smell. So Abby was, um, actually she enjoyed all of this attention and it gave her, um, it kind of gave her, um, she loved doing it, but she was very provocative. So now her daughter, who is Ala Foster, here she looks very severe, but really she was only between 12 and 15 in this picture. And she's got a tie on and she looks um, quite serious. Her, her hair, which was long, was all tied up in a bun. Ala Foster, as I mentioned before, is um, a woman who, mar who never married, but Ala Foster is um, the first woman that we have among our daughters who did go off to college. And the reason that I like to talk about Ala um, in her relationship to her mother is their letters are when Ala is in college. Let me back up for just a moment and talk to you about why Abby becomes a closer mother to Ala as Ala enters her teens. Ala was born with scoliosis. Now, some of us, when we were in grade school, maybe even younger than that, were checked by our doctors if we looked like we had sort of the curvature of our spine. Many of us of my age, in our 70s, remember standing up and having the school nurse look at our backs and decide if we um, had a curved spine or not. Ala had a very severely curved spine. So Ala had to wear a brace for 10 years. This was a metal, almost like a corset that she wore all through the, her lower back and core sec, excuse me, her core section. And it had to be um, tightened every year, but it also had to be adjusted to grow as she grew. She started wearing it when she was only 10 years old and she wore it until she was 20. So this was a long time of her um, formative physically and emotionally years. Abby showed herself to be an extremely devoted mother when she left the lecture circuit of her anti-slavery work and came home to stay with Allah. Let me tell you a little bit more about Ab Abby and her husband, Stephen Foster, who was also an abolitionist, who was also very active on the lecture circuit. So they were the best example of co-parenting of the four groups of mothers and daughters that I have in my book. Stephen Foster stayed home for more months at a time than his wife did Well, their daughter was being raised. And he also helped out when her, um, when their daughter had the brace. Stephen was a very active farmer, which was, when you think that he was on the road lecturing and he was also writing and going to many, many meetings, he was even an employee of the American Abolitionist Society. Stephen was a farmer who spent many months at home trying to put together a rocky farm in New England, um, just out of Worcester, Massachusetts. So what they did is they took on Stephen's sister, Caroline, to help take care of Alla. Alla, very interesting, never indicates either in her memoirs, which we are so fortunate to have, or in her letters that she was upset with her mother for not being with her for months and years at a time, or upset with her father. She understood thoroughly what they were supposed to be doing, what they were um, passionately involved with, which was anti-slavery, and then a little bit later, women's rights. Alla herself was not exactly 
self-educated. But while she was home, lots of times she was unable to go to school. She self-taught many advanced classes. Her father helped her teach advanced, learn advanced math and history and political science. And so she was preparing herself to go to college. In the 1840s, there was no high school for girls. There was only a high school for boys in Massachusetts. So Ala found a college that would take girls. This is a college that we all know well, and this college is called Vassar. Ala probably looked a little bit more like this when she went to Vassar. And I use my chapter on Ala to talk so much about Vassar College. I think, again, one of the many myths that I held for a school like Vassar is that it would be very progressive, that it would push its young students to learn about politics and economics and possibly even how to become um, active in the outside world. But this was almost the exact opposite. Matthew Vassar, who made all of his money on um, beer, actually, he was a brewer, he took on the chore of forming a school that would inspire and educate, but also protect young girls. The initial college opened in 1868 and Martha or Ellen Alla was one of its first students. Alla went more prepared than almost any of the other girls more than 200 young girls from the Northeast, including New York State, Massachusetts, and the other New England states came to Vassar again because there was no boys, there was no girls high school. And this was one of the best options for them if they wanted to, um, to learn something beyond how to be a proper young lady. Vassar's students were housed in one big building where they had their classes, where they had their religious services, which they had quite often, where they had their meals and where they lived in or in their small dorm rooms. Of the first class at Vassar, Ala was one of 23 girls. So it was very, very small, very exclusive. But Vassar chose from the very beginning that it would highlight the physical sciences so it built a wonderful planetarium and it has a wonderful telescope, which today is in the Smithsonian, but Ala did not look in that direction. She took on what we would call today the liberal arts, but she was exposed to many, many high levels of science. One of the problems with Vassar, which I will talk with you a little bit more again when I talk about Harry Stanton, is that the girls were not able to take politics, they were not allowed to take economics, and they were less apt to take political science and modern history than if they were in a co-educational men's and women's college. Alla Foster, when she was at college, just flirted with being a troublemaker. Um, her mother was hoping when she saw that she was beginning to oppose some of the rules at school that um, Alla would jump in the bandwagon and make a little bit more noise, just like her mother would have done. But Alla said, mother, I am so proud of what you and father have done in your life. You are such wonderful, wonderful leaders and reformers. I will never be like that. And I think we all have to be glad that I'm not any worse. So she didn't really have high hopes for herself to be an activist. But one of the best lessons that we have from Allah is that she showed us how to be a new woman. In the late 1800s, in the 1870s, when she was graduating college, in the 1880s, Many college women never got married. Alla never got married, but they found a niche in their professions. Alla was a teacher, as I mentioned before. She taught mostly young women and she did something extremely interesting. Alla herself acquired some land in New Hampshire. She and Abby, and let me stop here to tell you that when Abby was getting old and her husband had died, Alla was the person who kind of reversed role models 
and became, instead of the daughter, became the mother of um, Abby, told her how she should behave in her boarding room, in her boarding house, and told her um, what to do when her eyesight got bad, told her how to knit, um, talked with her about um, how she should eat better food and how she should go out for fresh air walks and that kind of thing. Um, but she never lived with her. And that's an interesting concept when you think of absent Abby. Well, Alla was almost absent herself because she worked in Boston her whole life. She did not live in Wor Worcester, which was about 40 miles from Boston. So she kept her distance and she kept her own apartment always. She was the only woman among all the four daughters who always rented but had her own apartment and furnished it and kept her own house without any servants. But she also acquired apartment or acquired um, property in New Hampshire. And in this property, she formed a lodge and she set up a lodge in which she taught her women students how to become waitresses, how to become cooks, how to help care for people who came and stayed in the lodge and how to um, go on and become um, women that had a little bit different interests than just becoming Irish servants like many of them were or school teachers. She gave them a little bit more independence and independence was the key to the lives of all the five, four daughters that I'm talking about here. Their mothers had a goal that they would all be independent. Alla Foster was a great example of a woman who was college educated, who found her niche. And one of the most fascinating things she did when she retired in New Hampshire in a little town called New Sandwich, New Hampshire, Alla established woman suffrage long before it was established in the rest of Massachusetts. So she, um, she became a leader the way she wanted to be a leader. She may not have been promiscuous and she certainly wasn't at a podium making a speech, but she became a leader and that's Alla. So the third group is Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Harriet Stanton Blatch. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, again, born in 1815, died in 1902. We know her best from her women's rights pioneer work from the Seneca Falls Convention, from all of the many, many, many writings that she left us, from many of her books, from the Woman's Bible, from her um, many conventions that she came to later in life. Let me talk to you a little bit about Elizabeth and Harriet when Harriet was a little girl. Here's a picture um, of a most traditional mother-daughter relationship. I use the phrase, a dependence both denied, because this was a mother and a daughter who began with a denial that they really relied on each other. Interestingly, Elizabeth is the one daughter who never went off to grade school by at a boarding school. She barely went to school without her mother um, taking great interest in getting her there, bringing her home and tutoring her at home. Elizabeth spent a lot of her time tutoring her children. They did not have a governess. They did not have a tutor. Elizabeth had seven children. Her boys went off to boarding school but she tutored her two daughters and she taught them at home. She was a homeschooler. As Elizabeth realizes that she's really emotionally attached to her daughter, her daughter becomes ready not to be emotionally attached. Another universal relationship, I think, that we see throughout the ages. I call Elizabeth emotional Elizabeth. And I guess if some of us think of Elizabeth Cady Stanton in her robust personage with her beautiful white crown of hair and her quite sophisticated and um, very well um, satisfied manner does not seem like she depends on anyone for her emotions. Um, we know that she had a husband that was often not there, that they did not have a um, relationship, that they were depending on each other. Elizabeth was very independent, but when it came to her daughter, the older her daughter got, the more that Elizabeth relied on her daughter, the more emotional she was. So here they are as mother and daughter as when um, Harriet is a baby. This is in 1856 when Harriet was under a year old. 
And um, again, this is a, a pretty famous picture of Elizabeth before she has her famous white curls. And she um, is in a, an attractive bonnet. She was not of a Quaker heritage at all, like both Martha and um, Abby were. And she was very um, apt to wear lovely clothes. Look at the lace on her sleeves, the lace at her neck. And um, she loved garnishing her own body with beautiful black lace, often in beautiful clothing. This sometimes seems like um, a, uh, an unreliable um, way of dressing for the women we think of, but they really um, wanted to look good and they also wanted to um, to look like the other women that they were with. They The women wore corsets, certainly Elizabeth Cady Stanton wore a corset as did Susan B. Anthony. And um, they were austere and their dresses were right down to the floor, except on the few years they were wearing bloomers, but that did not work out so well. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton wanted very much for her daughter to be um, self-possessed. When she was very little, Elizabeth started leaving her daughter with her mother and she would go off and do lecture tours. And when um, poor Harriet was only four years old, she missed her mother terribly. So again, there's this back and forth, emotional, not emotional, denial of the way they relied on each other. And this is one of the most interesting aspects of their relationship, especially the older both women get. This is Harriet as I'm gonna say maybe 24 years old when she had just um, graduated from Vassar. Harriet herself never, as I said, never went to boarding school, but she did end up at Vassar College. Not her first choice. And you know why? Because of what I told you about Vassar. Harriet knew that about Vassar. She knew that it was a, an, an exclusive place for girls that were not really led out of the um, house very often. They were well protected and they did not have the challenging classes that Harriet wanted. Harriet wanted to go to Cornell, which was a co-educational college where her brothers went, but that was not the case. That would not happen because her aunts were going to pay for Vassar and Vassar only, and her mother wanted her to go to Vassar. Harriet took great advantage of Vassar's science classes. She became very friendly with a professor who led her to love astronomy and became very, very proficient in science and in physics and in astronomy. And some people argue that Harriet might have become a scientist if her parents had allowed it. It's unsure, it's not, it's not clear. But Harriet got much independence at college. And um, she also got a lot of her politics at college because she insisted, she started a system among the students and that they all had to read a daily newspaper. Now this is astounding in those days because the girls remember, the young women remember that this was something installed by Harriet later at one of the graduate or one of the um, regatherings of alumni. She never remembered that she did this, but she was very influential. Although she hated Vassar the whole time that she was there. Harriet goes on to marry an Englishman. And before she gets there, let me tell you how her mother did the guilt trip with her. So imagine when you are a college senior, if your mother had written a letter that said this, and this is what Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote to Harriet Stanton. I will cling like a burr to you forever. I am so in love and relying on you to be part of my life. Well, Harriet's response to that was to get out of town. She, right after graduation, she did something with her mother for a year, but after graduation, she literally went to Germany to become a mother's helper. And there she met, um, there she met Harriet, Harry Blatch. Um, Harry Blatch was a very wealthy businessman. He had a lovely home in um, England and Harriet married him and they lived there and they had two children. 
So Harriet became active in the suffrage movement in England while she was there. She was only there for 20 years, but that was the major, you know, the first two decades of her married life. Then she, um, she got her independence from her mother, but then something very interesting developed. And again, this happens to lots of women of an elderly or an older era. They may not rely on each other for their personal relations, but they rely on each other's children to make them closer. Once Elizabeth Cady Stanton became a grandmother and she was called the queen mother, she took on a whole new role and she and Harriet bonded over Nora. Nora Blatch was the granddaughter that Elizabeth adored. Nora would go on to become um, a suffrage leader as well. But in her youth, Nora also went to boarding school and she was very, very similar to her mother in that she became very independent. She, um, she wanted to, um, to go off and learn things that other girls were not expected to learn in England in the early 1900s. What probably changed Nora's life as well as Harriet's life was that Harriet had a second little girl named Helen. And when Nora was probably nine, Helen died at four years old of an illness. Elizabeth Cady Stanton never even met little Helen and Harriet um, endured this terrible, terrible loss without her mother being present. And the letters they write to each other about the funeral and about the loss are, again, a wonderful example of a mother-daughter relationship and a, a dependence that they did keep denying that they, they needed so much. This is um, a picture of the three generations. This is Nora, this is not Helen. Helen at this point was not even born yet. Nora's perhaps six, maybe seven here. This is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the way we are most familiar with her, with her white curls and her large body and all of her lace. Sophisticated, lovely Harriet and her daughter. These are the three generations. And this um, generational relationship was one that fed Elizabeth in her old years tremendously. She ended up teaching a lot of her feminist ideas more to Nora than she did to Harriet. She inspired Nora in many ways. Matter of fact, Nora came to live with Elizabeth Cady Stanton while she was in college. Nora went to Cornell. She was the first young woman in Cornell to graduate with an engineering degree. And while she was doing that, Harriet began to become, to become active in the New York State woman suffrage movement. So when they came back to America to live in New York City with Elizabeth, Elizabeth had become quite infirm. Um, she lost her eyesight, Nora often was her reader and she lost her ability really to, to move around. She certainly lost her ability to travel. So in the end, she relied on all three generations, two generations, daughter and daughter, daughter and granddaughter to give her um, a reason for living really. Her husband had died long before. Her sons were not living nearby and not providing what her daughter did. And so we see the way mothers could be flexible enough that they were determining what aspect of their daughter would they want to encourage. One of the myths that I came into the research with was that domestic life would not be very important to the women's rights leaders, that they would not emphasize that when they taught their daughters. I found the exact opposite. Every single mother found it most important, not only that their daughters are educated, formal education, college was wonderful, but that they know how to feed, um, know how to feed chickens, know how to make a pie, know how to hire reliable servants, know how to run a house if they are single or if they are married, and know how to balance the books, know how to keep track of money, and know a quite a few 
skills of survival, really. So this is um, certainly Harriet was happy whenever she and Elizabeth were sharing women's rights activities together. And Elizabeth would be thrilled when her daughter was participating in those rights, but it was not the essence of their relationship. It was not what I expected, but in a way it was a great, great thrill to see how human these daughters, granddaughters, grandmothers and mothers were, which was the core, I think, of my research that we are so used to seeing these women at a podium making a speech. It's so important for us as historians, as readers, as lovers of women throughout history to see them like we are. Um, they endured loss, the pie burned, the chickens didn't lay eggs, the baby died, lots of things happen, it's life. Our fourth couple is Lucy Stone and Alice Stone Blackwell. The way I shorthanded them in terms of describing them was partners for the cause. Of all the four daughters, Lucy and Alice were the, the demonstrators of a mother-daughter team that remained the closest in their goals for women for reform, for life, from the beginning to the end. Here's a, oh, and the phrase I use to describe Lucy is loving Lucy. Um, she had to figure out how to love her kid, just like we all have to figure out how to love our children, love our nieces, love our nephews, love the people that we teach. But she did it in her own unique way. Here's Lucy and her daughter. Lucy's claim to fame when she was young, she married um, not until she was 37 years old. So she was the oldest of all the women. She was a woman's rights and an anti-slavery speaker from the moment she left Oberlin College. She's the only one of the four women's rights leaders that went to college. She fought her way to get a voice while she was at college. She had to form a debating team in order to be heard. She was not allowed to speak out. She was um, one of the people chosen to give a, a talk at graduation and the professors wouldn't allow her to do it out loud. So she said, I won't do it. And so little by little, she really became one of the best public speakers that our American history, men or women have ever known. She would mesmerize an audience for hours, the way our children watch TV and we watch public lectures on TV or on TED Talks. Lucy Stone, again, she kept her maiden name, was an electrifying speaker. I wish we had tapes to hear her, to hear her voice, because evidently it was one of the most amazing in the 19th century when people went to lectures for entertainment. Um, on the Lyceum, she was one of the fifth best speakers in the catalog. She was one of the th only three women um, among 50 men and she was astounding. She did not go without criticism, however. Just like Abby, sometimes when she was speaking, she would be the recipient of rotten fruit or rotten eggs because people did not like the fact that she was speaking publicly. It was only the 1840s. They were promiscuous audiences. She was talking about slavery. She was talking about women's rights. She was very unpopular for the people that didn't agree with her. But people came to see her because they were fascinated by what she had to say. Even if they disagreed, they were fascinated. When Lucy has Alice Stone Blackwell, she is 39 years old and she is going to retire. She said, I cannot leave my baby alone. So she says to Susan B. Anthony, who did not like the fact that all of her friends are marrying and having babies, give it a rest, Susan, take a break. I'm married. I'm happy. I'm a mother. I'm not going to um, leave this nursing baby. I'm not going on the road. I'm not lecturing. Um, when, when Alice was about six months, 
Lucy took um, a chance. She made an experiment and she left Lucy, sorry, she left Alice overnight with someone for just one night and she went and did a lecture. And the whole time she was terrified that something would happen to Alice and she missed her terribly. So she came home and stayed with her daughter. So Alice was born in 1857, which was just at the um, very beginning of the country's conflict that would led, lead to the Civil War in 1861. So the, the years that Alice and Lucy were home together as mother and daughter, and they were often without Henry, Henry Blackwell was off trying to make a living all over the country, but he was often not home, usually not home. So Lucy and Alice spent years um, together alone all throughout the Civil War. They had um, a little cottage they rented in Orange, New Jersey, and they became very close. Alice's health was not as bad as, um, as Olive's. She did not have to wear a back brace and she did not miss days and days of school, but she had poor eyesight. And when she did feel poorly and had to stay home, Lucy was her tutor. So Lucy also was a homeschooler. And it's probably pretty true that most women in the 19th century found themselves schooling at home for their daughters because there weren't the opportunities that there were for young boys. So Alice goes off to college. This is what she would, um, well, here she's a little bit younger than college. She goes to college. She also goes to boarding school before that. Alice has left us a wonderful, wonderful gift. Alice wrote a journal when she was 12, 13, and 14. She was not at boarding school. She was living with her mother and father. This was after the war. It was, she began her journal in 1870. And she and her mother and father were living in Boston. And Alice tells us what it's like to be an adolescent in the 1870s through her journal. It's very funny. It's very poignant. She was far more religious. Many people say to me, were all the girls, did all the mothers and daughters go to church? No, they did not. Not at all. By and large, nobody went to church. Nobody was part of organized religion at all. One of the things Alice tried to um, encourage her mother to do was to become spiritually involved. At least by reading um, sermons, or going to talks, if not joining a church. Alice um, also, I thought maybe if these girls went to boarding school or to day school, that they would encourage uh, their student friends to be um, favorite of women's rights. Alice had a terrible time with the fellow students. None of them thought it was appropriate. They thought it was outrageous that young girls should be talking about women's rights, much less conventions. So Alice never went to a woman's rights convention, um, nor did Lucy feel that she needed to. Again, Lucy was home with Alice, teaching her the basics, domestic skills, how to become independent, how to get ready for college. So Alice goes to college, but she does not go away. Alice goes to Boston University, which is around the corner. She lives at home and her mother and father leave home and they start lecturing out in Kansas. This By this time, it's um, 1867. Kansas is voting for um, voting rights for women and for African-Americans. And Lucy and Henry want to be out there where the action is and that's where they are. And Alice is home going to college on her own, running a house, supervising the servants, taking care of the gardener, making jam, making pies, and learning where her niche will be in the world. Alice never marries. She gets her degree from Boston. She becomes one of the earliest women journalists in America. She definitely becomes a new woman. She is single. She is using her skills. She is inspiring other women and she is editing a journal called the Woman's Journal. Lucy and Henry started the journal and handed it over to Alice and said, Alice, what we expect you to do is be the new editor of the journal. Fortunately, this worked well for Alice. Alice had not seen another. She was not interested in teaching. She was not interested in another career, but Alice goes on and does many, many more things 
um, once she leaves the journal. She becomes the most internationally well-known of all the daughters. She works for the Armenian rights during the Turkish-Armenian wars, and she becomes a translator of Armenian poetry. She um, is well known in human rights in the, um, in the international arena. And when she dies, they laud her for those kinds of things and just barely mention that Lucy Stone is her mother. So we have four mother-daughter situations here, all of which are somewhat different. So let me close. I'm going to stop my screen share and go back to a final statement about my, my women who, as I hinted to you, I came in to the book assuming one thing. And I think this is the greatest research when you come in and you make one assumption and then you discover something else. So bear with me, please, while I read a conclusion. Martha, Abby, Elizabeth, and Lucy saw the struggle for women's rights and women's suffrage central to their lives, but they didn't expect their daughters to have the same goals. The reform mothers left legacies. They left writings, statues, portraits, and achievements named for them, but they left so much more. They left the legacy of their precocious daughters. Their work made it possible for their daughters to fulfill dreams that they barely imagined. Reform mothers had simple wishes for their daughters, not unlike the desires of all mothers in all eras, not unlike yours and mine. They hoped their daughters might take satisfaction re from reform and activism as they had, but they were far more concerned that their daughters learned skills that made them independent. They taught their daughters how to milk a cow, gather eggs, plant a vegetable garden, make bread, hire honest kitchen help, and balance the family books. They pushed them to pursue education, friendships, and love. They might become wives and mothers themselves, but only if they wished. If reformed daughters dipped into their mother's work in women's rights, this would be something extra. It was appreciated, but not expected. When Ellen Wright, Olive Foster, Harriet Stanton, and Alice Blackwell looked at their mother's lives, they did not see reform mothers. Like all children, like us, they each viewed their mother as a source of love, creativity, and inspiration, then determined how to shape and fit a life that suited them. Their mothers made it clear that they never sought to remake themselves in their daughters. Martha Wright, Abby Kelly Foster, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone were not reform mothers to their daughters. They were simply mothers. Thank you.